Hey everybody, welcome to ARE Live. I'm Mark Tier, the founder of Black Spectacles, and today I'm with uh, Mike Newman, and we're going to be discussing the programming, planning, and practice exam, um, and in particular the mock exam uh, that we issued yesterday. Um, before we get started, um, if you'd like to attend our next ARE Live broadcast, where we're going to be featuring recently licensed architects uh, and how they passed all sections of the, their exams, uh, you can register at blackspectacles.com slash podcast. Um, and during the broadcast, you'll have a chance to ask questions to the group as well as to Mike. Um, we'll be actually featuring some different architects than we did last time. We did this about three or four months ago. And it was a really interesting session. Um, everybody, I think, kind of takes a different... Um, a different angle on, uh, on achieving licensure, so it's always um, good to hear um, a couple of different ways to do it. Um, so it should be a good session. Now, if you don't know Mike, um, he's an adjunct professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He's also the founder of Shed Studio, and he is the instructor for Black Spectacles online AIA ARE prep curriculum. Um, if you haven't already checked out our ARE prep cu curriculum, head over to blackspectacles.com to watch any of the free tutorials from the courses. Uh, and today we have a special Black Spectacles uh, promo code to share at the end. And then also, at the end of today's episode, we'll uh, choose someone from all the folks who submitted their answers to this mock exam. And they're going to win a free one-month ARE uh, Plus software uh, tutorials, Black Spectacles membership. And um, we'll be tracking your answers uh, for everyone who submitted. And for everyone who gets all of them right, we'll actually be uh, sending out free Black Spectacles t-shirts to all of you. So we'll be tracking all of your answers, uh, tracking uh, Mike's uh, correct answers here, and, uh, and announcing them at the end as well. So make sure you stay tuned to the end for all those, um, all those things. And lastly, uh, tonight we'll be taking questions using the GoToWebinar question box here, as well as on Twitter using the ARE Live podcast hashtag. So make sure you use that if you have any questions you'd like to ask. Um, um, so I, sw I guess at this point, let's hand it over to you, Mike. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, as Mark said, we're going to be talking about programming, planning, and practice, which is the ARE 4.0 version of the exam. Um, a lot of this uh, discussion actually will get under 5.0, will get distributed out through a number of the different uh, uh, topics under both uh, uh, the one regarding practice, the one regarding specific projects, and then also uh, quite clearly the beginning phase one. Uh, of the four that are in the sequence in a row. So we'll talk about that later. Um, but let's, uh, let's just dive in. Um, one of the things that I think is reasonable to say about uh, programming, planning, and practice is that uh, this is one of those uh, exams that is uh, kind of a catch-all, that it, it's sort of, there's a whole, uh, whole wide range of uh, potential uh, topics that can come from here. And you'll find there's a lot of crossover between uh, construction documents and service, uh, as well as site planning which, I mean, clearly site planning, programming planning and practice. Uh, practice has a lot of stuff about uh, kind of contracts and all of that. So obviously, even just from the words, you can tell there's a lot of uh, overlap. They do come at these questions from slightly different angles, um, but, uh, but you'll find that uh, some people will often use the PPP as one to start with because once you've studied for PPP, Program Planning and Practice, that you'll find that it, you've already started your studying for some of the other ones. Uh, uh, other people will go the opposite way and kind of do it at the end because uh, once they've studied for everything else, they sort of have a lot of the studying done already. But like uh, that's the kind of thing you should start thinking about is it's like, you know, what's the strategy that I can uh, employ? excuse me, that I can employ uh, when it comes to these things. But given that, let's just jump into our little session here. Um, okay. Uh, you and the client, uh, this is the first uh, question here. Um, uh, you and the client are unsure of how the bids are going to come back. Uh, the client is worried that the cost will be too high. Uh, and. Uh, will require redoing all the work uh, to get all the bids that uh, to fit their specific budget. And the question is asking, what should you suggest to the client? And we have uh, four different possible answers. First one, nothing. It is contractually important that you do not get involved in bids or dollar amounts so you, because you don't want to become liable for any problems. B, uh, telling the bidders to bring their costs down, uh, otherwise no one will get awarded the bid. C, create a bid form that includes add alternatives um, for portions of the work that are uh, deemed not primary, of not primary concern. 
uh, or D, create two bid forms and two sets of bid drawings such that one is simpler and cheaper uh, and then you can bid them out simultaneously. Uh, so as always, there are sort of aspects of uh, rightness in many of the potential answers, but there's really only one that uh, speaks to how the NCARB and AIA feel that you should be thinking about these things. Uh, and the, the answer is uh, C, create a bid form that includes add alternatives. Now, that's one way to do it, uh, is doing it through what's referred to as ads. Uh, the other way to do it is what's referred to as deducts, right? So it's the same basic idea. Uh, either I start with the whole thing and then say, but also give us a price if we didn't do the swimming pool or if we didn't do the west wing or whatever, um, uh, or a change of materials, maybe from a higher grade material to a lower grade material. Uh, and that would be, those would be considered deducts from the overall, or we can have the uh, bid price be the sort of more contained element, and then what would it cost to add the pool or add the more expensive uh, siding material or whatever it is. Um, so the concept there is either way, that core element of what the actual bid is, if, especially if you're doing it as an ad, has to answer the needs of the client to at least enough of an extent that if they actually did go forward, it would be enough of a building for them. But also, importantly, from, for the exam topic, it also has to still, like you can't get rid of one of the exit stairs, right? Um, that's sort of an obvious one, but you can imagine lots of scenarios where whatever the um, add or deduct was would make the building not meet uh, current codes. Uh, and so, you know, clearly that can't fly. So the, the concept here is it has to meet the health, safety, and welfare of the public, but also meet the needs of the client, at least in the sort of primary sense. And then we can adjust the overall, once we have the real numbers, to sort of find a happy medium between what the bids are coming back and what the client actually has budgeted. Uh, so a couple of other things to say in terms of A, um, about being liable. Um, you actually don't have any choice. You actually are uh, not liable, that's really too strong a word, but it is expected that uh, the architect is um, uh, in conversation with the client about costs from the beginning. In fact, the expectation is that at each of the different phases, so at schematic design, at design development, et cetera, uh, that each of those phases, uh, you would be putting forth your sort of best guess as to what uh, a cost estimate is. So you are already expected to be part of that. Um, so A doesn't really make any sense. It does sound right though, because there's lots of other things where you don't want to get involved because then you take on liability. Uh, so you just want to be clear, the liability issues are generally going to be about the relationship to the contractor. Uh, and there's a number of situations where you actually are pretty deeply involved with the owner to the point where you actually, it's referred to as agency, you have agency with the owner, meaning you can speak for the owner, or you can, uh, you know, you're working very closely there. What you do is representative of the owner, that kind of thing. Um, so A, doesn't make any sense. Uh, telling the bidders to just bring their costs down, uh, you know, that doesn't make any sense either because the whole point of the bid is to find out a real number. And if you tell them something like that, all that's going to do is bring the change orders down the road that's going to make everything uh, not make sense uh, down the road. Uh, and D, uh, create the two bid forms. I've actually done that before. Um, it's a really, really bad idea. It's, first of all, a huge amount of work. It's very confusing. Um, there's lots of sort of legal, ethical reasons why you shouldn't, like in general, you should not be asking uh, contractors to bid things that they don't really have a chance to win because um, it's a lot of work and it's just not ethical. Uh, but there, were, there are occasionally sort of crazy situations where it just mandates because of timing that you do something like that. But the answer from an NCARB standpoint would never be D. Uh, like it's always about managing the process, not letting the process take over. So uh, C, ads and deducts. Hope, uh, hope that worked well for everybody.